together. We are here. Hi, hello. Hey. Hey. Happy to meet you. Can you hear me now? Hi. Yeah, I can hear you now. I'm all right. I'm all right. I don't know how to answer it, but the things are getting very tough. It's a critical moment of human history. This pandemic brings to bear the stark realities in which we have lived in for a very long time. Our current system has facilitated this crisis. This crisis didn't need to be this big. It's like crumbling and the kind of existing fault lines are being exposed. The rules are being rewritten. But who is writing them? How? And for whom? This is a lockdown. We are on a subtle point, ready to tip in either direction. It forces us to think about our connections. It's an opportunity for us to reflect on what are the most important, the vital things in our lives. To rediscover the sense of community. The solidarity, togetherness, unity. This is something we've been yearning for. Together, we hold each other. We move forward. Rebuild forwards. Reimagine forwards. Organize forwards. Think forwards. Teach forwards. We show in the kind of world that we should build together. So, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to the Progressive International. My name is Renata Avila, and I am part of this, but I'm not on this alone. Uh, first, I, I have to say, and I have to recognize that the, this uh, energy, this action, this network didn't come out of our ideas or our head. It came, it is a work that have taken generations to build. We are in the shoulders of giants. We have to recognize the many movements all over the world that had allowed us and enabled us to have what this humble effort that we have today. And we also have to reflect that today, the difference of yesterday and today is that today, in spite of being in lockdown in up to 111 countries all over the world, and in spite of restrictions on freedom of expression, restrictions on freedom of assembly everywhere, we are united tonight and we are connecting tonight and we need to seize this opportunity. So our work is about unity, it's about organizing, it's about mobilization, it's about activation, it's about learning from each other. And um, uh, it's about also collaboration. Uh, before starting, I want to thank publicly, all the volunteers that have taken part of this, all the new, welcome all the new members, and especially thank Rusha, Gonja, Vitali, Matt, Reshko, David, Andres, and all the many other names behind this effort. And also thank Janice and Jane Sanders, and uh, Catherine, who we will hear about her later, who started all of this. And uh, because I said that the most important thing is that we are learning from each other, our first guest uh, here will be uh, someone who has inspired us, uh, who is also part of a movement and representing this movement um, uh, tonight with us of Fridays for Future. Uh, she, uh, her name is Vanessa Nakate and she comes from Uganda. And she's going to share with us some reflections on the role of young women and children and the role of the Global South in this mobilization. Welcome, Vanessa, and it is really an honor to have you here and to learn from you tonight. Oh, so it seems that there's some little uh, technical glitch. So uh, we will wait for Vanessa, and while we wait for Vanessa, we will I, I will have the honor and the pleasure uh, to introduce you to a visionary and some of the most inspiring uh, uh, politicians of our times, Katrin Jacobsdottir. Uh, she's the prime minister of Iceland. And imagine we have our, a, a prime minister, a female prime minister, a green pr a prime minister and progressive prime minister in our first 
activity uh, with the Progressive International. Welcome, Catherine, and I'm happy, to, uh, happy and inspired to hear what you have to say to us tonight and what we can learn from you. Thank you, Renata, and congratulations to all of us for a very good launch this week. And I think this is just the beginning, uh, actually, because we're asking progressives around the world to join us and help us to form this movement. And, and my movement, the Left Green Movement in Iceland, became part of the Progressive International when Yanis Varoufakis and Bernie Sanders made their initial call to action in 2018. And uh, I have also been involved personally since then. And actually, my involvement is motivated by two factors. First, it's my very firm belief. And I think this pandemic that we are going to talk about here also today shows us that there is so much need for greater international collaboration among progressive forces, not least because of the growing influence of right-wing authoritarianism in the world, which poses fundamental threats to human rights and democratic and pluralist practices, but also to media freedoms and judicial independence. But I also think uh, it's important to emphasize that the Progressive International has this positive vision to fight for prosperity, security, and dignity for all people. And now when we are faced with a second very serious economic crisis of this century, the need for Progressive International is even more urgent. Sheer visions, tactics, ideas to prevent this crisis to become even deeper and more harmful than it needs to be. The 2008 crisis, uh, and I was actually in government in Iceland back then from 2009 to 13 as a Minister of Education, that led to very uh, intense austerity measures around the world in far too many countries. We are still Still learning really about the harms that those austerity measures cost, and this time we must do it differently. We also know that uh, in times of crisis, there are always a lot of different, uh, how can I put it, interests that are at stake. Uh, the rich will try to find ways to become richer. They won't let the good crisis go to waste, and we shouldn't let the good crisis go to waste either. So when interest rates are actually close to negative, there will be an increasing pressure around the world on privatization of public goods. And also, if the past is a guide, we must prepare ourselves for a nationalist backlash. So because most probably uh, some political forces will seek to exploit the political anxieties that can be created by an economic slump. And as you mentioned, Renata, the question also remains what this crisis will do to our democracies. Draconian measures have eased the pressures on healthy systems in some, if by no means all countries, and lessened the human toll of the pandemic. Now, democratic politicians, sometimes reluctantly, uh, are increasingly delegating to health experts the effort to contain the crisis, even if some of them have sought to play politics with it. And Obviously, questions are bound to be raised about how far authority should go when expert advice dictates confinement or, or distancing or when vested economic interests make demands on governments. Now, in Iceland, actually, right now, my government decided that to follow, we should follow the advice of health experts. Uh, but we also said our priority is public health. Our priority is to save human lives. And what we have done is actually is that those health experts have had daily press conference meetings, shared all official statistics about how the virus is spreading. And they have also been humble that we don't know really all there is to know about this virus. So I think this has resulted in great public awareness about the pandemic. And that has actually helped to build trust and solidarity that we can actually do this together without the use of force or legislation. So we have actually been very focused on uh, this solidarity. So I think also, uh, which is really my final point here, that this COVID outbreak has demonstrated once again how important universal health care is, robust welfare system, because the economic consequences will be immense. And we already see it here in Iceland where we have unemployment rates going up to 15% right now. 
And as a feminist, I would also like to point out that what this crisis is showing us is that the, we, we have the women really carrying the flag in the healthcare system, taking care of the sick and the elderly. We have seen also the women in majority in the schools who have actually been playing the uh, key role and the people who keep our hospitals and schools and streets clean. Nothing works without those people. So it's really showing us what our society is made of and who the people are who are really uh, the pillars of society. So I think this shows really the need for progressive politics, uh, reminding us really of the value of the work of those people who are the pillars of society. And I think also because obviously Iceland is in a very different situation than many other countries in the world, the need for this international collaboration, the need for the richer countries to make their contribution uh, because this will definitely hit poorer countries harder than the richer countries of the world. So this is really the reason uh, why we take participate in this movement is because we really need a very strong uh, movement, progressive movement in the world to fight all the regressive tendencies that we are facing. Thank you. No, thank, thank you, and thank you. We are really looking forward that we ho really hope that we can have this summit uh, in Iceland, and if not, we are going to have virtual Iceland because yeah. it is possible. It is still possible, but you know, like uh, now that Vanessa is trying to connect, it also makes me reflect the big gap. Fifty, uh, almost fifty percent of humanity is disconnected. You know, and we need to be very creative, and we need to be very aware of our privilege. And also, as progressive international, we cannot be the progressive international online. We need to be there for all of them. And I know that Iceland has been like leading uh, in this digital democracy and real democracy efforts. And we count on you and we thank you and you inspire us. And thank you for mentioning um, also how visible the invisible work of women uh, yeah. the crisis made. And let's move forward. And we will hear and now uh, from Yanis Varoufakis, a small uh, reaction to, uh, to you and, and then wait for Vanessa. Hopefully she will join us. Well, thank you, Renata. Katrin, um, I bow in front of you, not only as a comrade and a friend, uh, but as Iceland's prime minister, because you mentioned the, right, the, the, the pivotal number, 2008, 2008, mm -hmm was our generation's 1929. And in the same way that 1929 began with uh, the collapse of Wall Street, and very soon after that, the sequence of bankruptcies, which uh, led to discontent, led to a massive uh, further uh, redistribution of wealth from the poor to the rich, from the poor to the rich during the crisis. And we know what the 1930s looked like. Mm -hmm. uh, the last 10 years, 12 years, uh, have been a very slow motion version of the period 1929 to 1931. Those two or three years uh, were expanded into a dozen years uh, by the largesse of central banks that printed all the money and they floated the financial sector while imposing austerity to the many. So socialism for the bankers, austerity for the many. One small nation, one small country stood up to this, proving that sovereignty remains crucial and proving that a small demos can make the difference in the word democracy. Uh, your country, uh, your people, the, the, you were an example to all of us. We in Greece, we also staged our own rebellion against debt bondage. 62% uh, of the population on the 5th of July 2015, after effectively a revolution, managed to, um, to, to, to shed the fear, you know, to, to remember what FDR said, that the only thing we must fear is fear itself. But, you know, the um, dependence on the Central Bank of Europe meant that uh, our people, unlike yours, were crushed. The result is 12 years during which uh, we had the zombification of much of capitalism and the, um, the fact that, you know, billions of people uh, live a hand-to-mouth uh, life. Uh, they are one payday away from ruin. And the coronavirus, what it has done, it has just revealed the immense fragility of a capitalism which is not even good at reproducing itself. So, you know, after 2008, the bankers managed to internationalize beautifully. I mean, internationalism has succeeded for the bankers. The fascists are doing the same thing under the able leadership of Donald Trump. 
with Le Pen, with um, Modi in, in, in India, Bolsonaro in Brazil. You know, the, the, the nationalist international, which sounds like a contradiction in terms, has been gaining strength. And now this discontent is going to unleash even more horrid forces of uh, ultra-rightism uh, and um, jeopardizing freedom of speech, judicial independence, as you said in your text. So we need to do that with progressives who were the original internationalists never managed to succeed in doing, internationalize and come together into this. So I'm very excited about this. Um, we are looking forward, all of us, to working with your folks, um, with your government, with your members. What can I say? Just thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you, Yanis, and thank you, Renata. And I do hope that at least, if not this autumn, you will be able to join us in Iceland at some point, at least. We will see how this develops. But I think also when we um, are talking about the challenges right now because of the coronavirus and how it will affect uh, different countries differently, uh, how it also affects uh, different classes differently. We can see that happening where people, for example, have to pay for their health care, that the virus is obviously having a much worse effect on the poorer people of society. So, so it really shows us uh, this urgent need for strong welfare systems in society. And when you talk about the crisis of 2008, Yanis, and uh, everything that Iceland and Greece went through at that point, uh, I think it was quite a blessing that we had uh, we had actually uh, that we actually could really choose our ways out of that crisis and, and implement what I call really mixed action because obviously there were some austerity measures in Iceland, but we could also raise taxes and do other things, uh, very important things for our uh, rebuilding of the society. I just have to mention climate because. One of the things that I am worried about is also the climate challenge is not leaving us. It, it will be right where we left it, really, when the coronavirus entered our lives. And uh, I am very worried that uh, this will might become a, a less priority after the epidemic, yeah. that this will be put aside. And this is a huge challenge for all of us. How can we continue to have climate uh, on the schedule and, and do progressive politics on climate? Exactly. Exactly as in 2008, the whole debate about the environment uh, was silenced. Mm -hmm. It will be silenced again with uh, the gigantic recession that is hitting the world, and which is strengthening the oligarchy. The oligarchy is always vested in uh, the most polluting um, practices in the world. They have mm -hmm. stuck all these uh, um, investments into cornering that market, and even if it's not even economically viable, they will do their best to make sure that the planet is destroyed before those investments are not paid. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you so much. Uh, I know that your agenda is very busy, so we really appreciate that uh, you stay with us uh, this time. We, know, we understand that you have to go back to work now. Uh, well, this is work as well. And uh, next with us is one of the uh, most exciting African thinkers and authors, Nanjala Niamola. And, and Nanjala is, uh, mm -hmm. is going to uh, share some reflections and we will continue this dialogue between uh, Janice, Nanjala and me, uh, waiting still for Vanessa. But um, before that, I want to mention that part of the Progressive International uh, is uh, three pillars. And one pillar I want to mention in this break is the media pillar, the wire. We are inviting all the independent, exciting, progressive uh, media outlets all over the world to join us. And you can check it in progressive.international and you can see how to join. Uh, so Nanjala, welcome. Uh, you're, uh, you're in Kenya, no? You're, uh, you're in Nairobi. I am. In I am in Nairobi and it's, yes. yes, and it's almost bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm really excited about um, being here and, and, you know, thinking through these really important ideas, I think, with a group of people who is ready to embrace radical ideas. And I love the word radical. I love the way that it is used in its original formulation. I keep coming back to Miss Ella Baker, who 
um, keeps reminding us that radical means going to the root causes and not just nibbling at the problems that we are facing as a society, but actually going to the heart of the challenges. And I think this particular COVID-19 moment is just showing us how important it is to have radical ideas on the table. We can't keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. You know, you've talked about the crisis of 2008. While here in Africa, we talk about the structural adjustment programs and what those austerity measures did to our universities, our hospitals, our public infrastructure. And, you know, the fact that there was no learning from that. The fact that scholars in the global south, that activists in the global south said, hey, these deep austerity cuts don't work. And nobody listened, well, nobody outside the continent listened and then went ahead and rolled them out in their own societies, I think is a really important reminder of how we have to learn how to listen to people outside the centers of power. We have to learn how to listen to communities outside the centers of power. And there is no true global progressive movement that doesn't recognize that great ideas can come from anywhere. They don't necessarily have to come from European universities or European capitals. Um, I just wanted to very quickly um, raise three or put three things on the table about re rethinking internationalism in this particular moment. I think that uh, you know, I I, grew, I went to you know political science undergrad, all of that stuff, with all of these ideas about how the Second World War ushered in a new era of justice and etc. And then I kind of you kind of come back to your country and you think, well, the Second World War ended in 1945. Britain's War of Independence in India start you know ends in 1947. Um, all of these detention camps, these racist practices, all of these injustices are being perpetrated in the global South in the decade after the Second World War. And so when you come from that particular framework, you can't help but interrogate the idea that these things are um, natural or given, and this is just how the world works. It's not. A lot of the principles that we espouse and we teach and we you know, preach about internationalisms are things that, rec that represent consensus and, and dialogue. And that means it can be shaken up. It means it can be made more inclusive. It means it can be made differently. And so the three th things that I would love for us to rethink um, when we're rethinking and reimagining um, internationalism in this era is, can the foundational principles of just of be justice and egalitarianism instead of balancing great powers? This question has become almost obsessive for me because I look at how China has behaved in the la last year. I look at how the United States has behaved in the last year. And there is no recognition between either one of those countries that this balance of power rhetoric is actually dangerous for the rest of the world. There is no recognition that lying about the extent of an outbreak, lying about your capacity to handle an outbreak, forcing countries to keep borders open in order to appear strong, all of these practices actually made the entire world less safe. So this balancing of powers principle, this idea that there has to be a great power, I want us to question it and trouble that presumption a little bit. What if the foundational principles for our new internationalism was justice and egalitarianism and centered on human beings instead of centered on institutions? What we're seeing right now is that, you know, the, even the most successful economy is only as strong as the least protected people in that society. And so if we can find a way in our rhetoric and our thinking about internationalism to recenter the human and recenter the vulnerable human and start thinking about justice and egalitarianism as foundational principles, I think we'll start to reimagine how uh, internationalism works or how internationalism is supposed to work. Um, the second thing I want to put on the table is can the guiding values, can the guiding uh, methodology be collaboration instead of competition? Um, with again, you know, I'm I'm speaking to you from Nairobi. I'm speaking to you from a country that, by the last estimate, has uh, 518 ICU beds for a country of 47 million, and we're scrambling to get pro protective PPEs, protective equipment, ventilators, all of these things, and we're finding that all the supply chains are closed down. Every country has started to look inward and say, well, let's protect our people first. Let's protect our systems first. Let's protect our IP or whatever first. And let's leave the rest of them to figure things out on their own. This idea that there's even, you know, public health is supposed to be like one of the most fundamental public goods. And now we're seeing that when it's tested in this particular paradigm, 
when it's tested, when it's pushed, even the countries that preach the most inclusive rhetoric outside um, in peacetime or in regular time will shut down the borders and start to look inwards. Where does that leave countries that just don't have the capacity to compete? In an international system foundation uh, uh, founded on competition, uh, it, it's necessarily pulling apart. So how do we start to think about collaboration and pulling together? Would the world look very different today if back in February and back in March we had thought, hey, how come we don't work together to figure out what the world will look like if this thing spreads, if this if COVID-19 spreads to countries like the Central African Republic, where the prime minister didn't even know that they had ventilators and it turns out that they have 14. Like, how do we start to move away from competition to collaboration? Um, and finally, this is something that really I feel so strongly about as a, as a philosophical principle. How do we put money back in its rightful place? I think that people seem to have forgotten that money is supposed to make things easier and you know, make it easier for, for transactions and to measure value and all of that stuff. Money is not supposed to be a substitute for values. It's not supposed to be a substitute for you know, measuring the goodness and the badness. And this might seem like a really abstract thing, but again, in the last five years, we've seen the international development space, the um, development aid competition uh, co conversation, and you know, powerful countries, wealthy countries thinking about providing assistance to poorer countries. It's become a bled of any pretext of values, and everybody's just trying to compete with this new emerging power. And so, it doesn't matter that a president is a dictator. And you know, today we're thinking about Zimbabwe and three opposition activists who disappeared and were uh, brutally assaulted by government agencies. And we're being told, well, you know, this this particular president is an ally of this particular powerful state, and so he must be appeased. That the rich country, the proxy country behind the leadership must be appeased. Money, the way in which we have, I, we have conceptualized and um, you know, theorized money in this particular order of things, I think it's really dangerous. I think this is, honestly to me, this is the fundamental, this is our original sin, that we've put aside any pretext. You know, I always like to come back, I, I guess just as proof of my geekiness, um, when you read the, the UN Charter and all of these great ideals and the first uh, three words in the UN Charter, we the people, yay. Is that really what is happening in the world today? Can we honestly say that the international system that we're living in today is actually guided by the principles of we the people? Or is it we the corporations? Or we the powerful states? Or we the Security Council? Or we, you know, the, the, the people who have the power to determine your digital uh, lives, we the, we the digital companies? Like, there's something that our measurement, our metrics of money, something really dangerous and toxic that has happened, that has displaced any sense of values, any sense of aspiration, any sense of unity, any sense of collaboration, that we have to go back to the basics and say, hey, maybe we need to start again. And I love what the prime minister said about my last point. <laughs> I love what the prime minister said about feminism and, and you know, using feminism as a tool for starting this conversation, because to me, Feminism is foundationally about interrogating power and looking at how the systems that we've built look like when our central reference object isn't the white man, when our central reference object is the person who is abstracted away from power, who is not the person we presume will benefit from the public goods. I think this is a really crucial moment to start exploring a feminist internationalism that is interrogating our presumptions about who the system is for and how power should be organized. You know, you are my kind of feminist and my kind of internationalism. <laughs> and listening to you, I mean, I could only think about where I come from. Where I come from is so similar, you know, Guatemala in mm -hmm. Central America. Mm -hmm. Similar problems, similar like yeah, politics, similar like abandonment and, and, and this struggle, this constant struggle. But, you know, like uh, uh, there's also uh, another kind of feminist that is coming up really, really strongly. And it is the feminist of very young women. 
I live in Chile, yeah. and in Chile, in, in the last year during the protest, it was amazing to see 12 to 14 yeah. year old girls jumping the metro stations and demanding, you know, social justice and going it. crazy. And we are seeing the same uh, with environmental activists everywhere, like in mm -hmm. my country, uh, indigenous peasants, very young girls demanding the rights in Brazil. Uh, young uh, Afro-descendant uh, women demanding the rights, demanding justice, and demanding the stop of murders. And tonight we have yeah. with us one of these champions, Vanessa Nakate, and, and finally connected, I think, I hope. Uh, let's be patient. Oh, did it drop? I think that is going to be great, the intervention of Vanessa, because she's making us wait for it. So in the meantime, <laughs> in the meantime, which is it? In the meantime, I think that uh, uh, Nanjala, Janice, Nanjala, it's, it's hard to respond to Nanjala. Uh, so I let the floor to you to respond because she goes with money and the reflection around money and finance. And I'm very, very curious what you have to say. You, you white European man in Greece uh, at a parliament, a man in power. What, what do you have to respond to the reflections of Nanjala? Well, Nanjala, um, yeah, so, so right that it's all about power in the end. So, you know, feminism, civil rights movements, trade unions, uh, they're all liberation movements, uh, the purpose of which is to uh, restore power to the powerless. And uh, that's what the progressive should be all about at a global scale, at a planetary scale. You mentioned, and it was remiss of me not to mention it, when I was speaking to Katrin before, uh, the structural adjustment programs of the International Monetary Fund and you know, the Washington Consensus back in the 1970s. That was the first time after the Second World War when international finance, in, in, a, in a sense, you know, the divinity of money, um, flexed their muscles using debt and unsustainable debt in order to effectively plunder societies in Africa and elsewhere. This was, um, if you want, a test case for them. It was a dress rehearsal for what was going to follow later on um, in, in Europe, in the middle of the Euro crisis. Uh, and I remember Christine Lagarde, then the managing director of the International Monetary Fund in 2010, when the Greeks were protesting about effectively our structural adjustment programs, you know, Oh, we were suffering what you had suffered decades before. She said, oh, well, we did work, we, you know, we imposed a lot more pain to the Africans. Why are you complaining? So this divide and rule is all about establishing power um, in, in, in a manner which uh, reproduces the capacity of the ex exceptionally very few, effectively, to, to, to rule the world. What this coronavirus crisis has done, uh, which is unique, is it has revealed, it has taken the, the, the cloak uh, of the uh, true face of politics. It has removed the masks. Because if you remember, I mean, you're too young to remember, of course, aren't you? In the 1970s, um, you know, the Kenyan uh, government, the Nigerian government, all sorts of African governments, in exactly the same way that the European governments in the Euro crisis, uh, they were throwing their arms up in the air saying, well, what can we do? We now are bankrupt. We need to go cap in hand to the IMF. Uh, Politicians love to appear as powerless people who are simply doing their best under circumstances not of their own choosing. But what the coronavirus has done for the first time, it has unveiled the immense power of government. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the moment they, sh they locked us down and they, you know, they even banned football matches, suddenly people can see that in the end politics is, uh, is, is about who does what to whom. That is yeah. you know, the, basic, uh, the basic issue. Who has the power to tell you what to do? And yeah. what can yeah. reconstitute your capacity to resist the power of the other? And usually the other, of course, is a male, yeah. Yeah. why feminism mm. uh, is mm. not a separate uh, movement from the movement to restore mm. the power of labor, the power of uh, communities over corporations. Yeah. It's one struggle yeah. because we have multiple identities. But uh, you know, liberation cannot be um, a la carte. It either comes as, 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 as a package or it just doesn't come yeah. at all. Uh, and yeah. the, 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 you know, uh, going back to the question of money that you raised so beautifully, 
Karl Marx gave the best definition of money I've come across. He defined it as the alienated capacity of humanity. So there is, wow. you know, there, there is, it's, it's, if you want, if you think about, about, about it, you know, money is a very abstract thing. It's very yeah. concrete and exceptionally abstract in the sense that, yeah. you know, what is it? It's not banknotes. 97% of money is not printed ever. Uh, who, who creates it? Yeah. Mostly private bankers, not the state, unlike what most people think. So it's like, the, like an invisible power, magical power. Yeah. But of course, there's nothing magical about it. What it does, it's a, it reflects your alienation, your alienation yeah. from your work, your alienation from any decisions as to you know, what matters and what doesn't matter. Whether you know, caring for uh, an, an elderly parent uh, is valuable, uh, less valuable yeah. than you know, printing collateralized debt obligations, which uh, have absolutely no value whatsoever, except that we make yeah. in Wall Street ex exceptionally rich. So it's all about the power to decide you know, what is powerful as an instrument. Money should be an instrument that it is in, in our uh, service. Yes. Our Not slave. the other way around. But you see, this is, this is the remarkable aspect of capitalism. Capitalism has always been uh, a schizophrenic beast. On the one hand, it has created huge productive capacities that we didn't have before capitalism. And at the same time, so these are li cap capacities for us to liberate ourselves. Yeah. Imagine yeah, we, we could build at very, very soon robots doing chores for us. So that's very liberating. Why should people do chores? They should you know, do other things like write poetry and look after each other um, and educate themselves and improve themselves. But at the same time, the robots, not themselves so much, it's not a science fiction movie, the need to have a system that accumulates capital through squeezing human labor, because this is how capitalism works, in the end, enslaves not only the workers, but also, this may sound a bit strange, the capitalists themselves. Because imagine, you know, their ag agony. If they do not squeeze the living daylights out of their workers, they will go bankrupt. They will become like them. Well, so well they, this they is exactly... The this is the mo this is the moment that I think we're in, and this is the decision that I think a lot of countries are facing, that we're stuck between um, uh, government I always like to imagine there's a triangle, governments and corporations and the citizen. And there's this tension between the three points of the triangle and trying to reconcile the three points of the triangle. And right now what we're seeing is, you know, in, in countries like mine, which have been avowedly capitalist since independence and since colonization, whether it was being imagined as a market or being imagined as an, a post-colonial state, that the tension has always leaned towards the governments and the corporations collaborating to squeeze the citizen. And this is a moment to reimagine that balance and to reimagine that particular um, um, triangle. But, you know, it's hard without there being some kind of coordination and some kind of collaboration between citizens' movements of different stripes, um, solidarity movements of dis different stripes, you know, the last pandemic that ravaged my country with HIV AIDS, that ravaged many countries around Africa, and created a dependency. It's created a dependency where, for example, our public health system is funded by donor governments. 24% of Kenya's public health system is funded by donor governments. 100% of our HIV programming is funded by foreign governments. 100% of our TB. 100. So when those particular donors pull the plug, they really have us. They really have us by the throat. And so as a citizen, you then find yourself powerless in a conversation, of, and it's really a life or death conversation. And so this is put another reason why these pandemics, um, you know, aside from the, the life calculations and the meta questions, this is one of the things that I keep coming back to as a political scientist is, what will our polity look like if in this moment of vulnerability, power is tilted so far in the direction of states and corporations that the citizen is left completely powerless again? In 1918, we got colonized. In, after the AIDS pandemic, we lost agency over many of our public goods. What will this look like if we don't figure out how to put more power into the hands of citizens? I see Vanessa has joined us, so I'm going to... Yes, uh, no, uh, just be before that, I, uh, because uh, Vanessa comes and goes, and now she's here, oh, so no. I have to interrupt you. I have to interrupt you, adult people, to bring the Friday for Future to uh, our stage and to our Progressive International. Vanessa is part uh, of our council. And we are very, very, very proud that she's uh, with us tonight with a lot of effort because of connectivity, something that we need to fix globally. 
And Vanessa, welcome. And we, we were like really waiting a lot for your words and your wisdom. Welcome and, and tell us, tell us what it, what it is to struggle as a young woman and lead a movement in Uganda. Uh, go ahead. Okay, we tried. <laughs> we tried, but something that, uh, oh, maybe she's back. <laughs> no, I know, Nanjala is back. Nanjala is back. But you know, Nanjala, something that you were mentioning uh, uh, where, where we left it, uh, and this break uh, um, uh, it helps me bring another of the pillars that we are working on the Progressive International, which is the blueprint. And the blueprint mm. is like minds like yours, minds like uh, uh, people like you and people like many, all, ma many, you know, like students and activists uh, watching this. Now with this technical expertise, we can put our education and our, our learning process at the service of people. And it's an open yeah. invitation uh, uh, for everybody to be part of the blueprint and to collaborate in the themes and streams from migration to climate, to economy, to feminism, to and in the topics that we need, uh, the concrete policies that we need progressive parties to take uh, a lead on. So uh, as Vanessa comes and goes, um, it's also a reminder of, of, of the infrastructural uh, uh, rethinking that we need with the big tech and all of that. But uh, I, let's I do, yes. I interrupt Renata. You're because, always. <laughs> uh, because there, there is one pillar that we don't have the right not to talk about. Because um, this is not just a, a problem with capitalist exploitation of North, South, women, and so on. We are entering, we already have entered, but now we're getting into the, the, the thick of a postmodern version of the 1930s. The crisis that started yeah. in 2008, and which is now escalating with uh, the coronavirus uh, lockdown. Uh, the complete collapse of both demand and supply globally. Uh, this is going to um, bring about something we haven't seen since 1931, 1932. That is a massive disconnect between a chasm, a gap of pro gargantuan proportions between the amount of money circulating in the financial yeah. sector around the world and the amount of investment into you know, the green transition, the jobs, education and so on. This gigantic disconnect between money available and money invested is going to create forces of deflation, already has created forces of deflation. Deflationary forces breed political monsters. We will have a new, we already have a new fascist international. And yeah. they are going, I, they don't even need to be in government. Uh, they no. influence existing parties, pushing them towards xenophobia, towards racism, towards patriarchy, towards browning the planet than, uh, rather than greening the planet. Uh, they will look at our peoples in the eye and say, we will make you proud again. We know you're suffering. We will give you a small pension, just like Mussolini did in the 1920s in Italy. Mm -hmm. yeah. And all we want from you is uh, a carte blanche to be authoritarian. Give us all the power and we will save you and we will make you proud to be Kenyan, Greek, yes. German, whatever. Now, yeah. that fascist international together with the Bankers International, they are helping each other. They seem to be, you know, the Davos crowd versus the nationalists, they seem to be at odds, but they're not. They are different sides of the same coin. The nationalists, ultra-rightists, they need the Davos crowd to create the austerity and the discontent that feeds the fascists. And the Davos crowd need the fascists in order to say, we are the only civilized force here around the world to unite humanity. But they are not. Mm. They are co-conspirators, even if it's subconscious, even if they hate each other. The progressive international must have as its main pillar fighting against these two faces of the same beast, the two heads of the same authoritarian beast that is breeding now as a result of the stupendous crisis of financialized capitalism, which is not just a crisis of the working class, it's also a crisis of industry. It's a crisis of, you know, small businesses. It is a crisis of everyone excepting the bankers and the fascists. 
Um, you know, when you were talking, I was thinking about some of the research that I've done about elections and how the impact of technology on elections. And one of the things that has is a, is a running is a recurring theme in my in my research is how a lot of the practices that are being decried in the Western election right now, you know, when you're talking about interference with Brexit, you're talking about interference with the Trump vote, were actually experimented on and tested on in India, in Kenya, in Nigeria, and um, we are kind of grappling with the fallout. And there's so much we can teach the world about what um, what happens when you're pseudo when you're what is supposed to be a democratic process when what is supposed to be an open and transparent process of choosing your leadership is compromised again by money is compromised but is also compromised by a cabal of people who are collaborating in an international level we're talking about a british corporation you know taking money from the kenyan government which in, is inadvertently the kenyan taxpayer in order to influence an election outcome we're talking about the same British corporation working in Nigeria, the same British corporation working in South Africa, working in India. There is an international coordinated effort to change, to disconnect the votes from the electoral outcome. And it is very highly, fine. it's very well, you know, deeply financed and, and very elaborately organized. Whenever I give these presentations, I always, I, I like to ask the room and, you know, people always get stymied. I said, well, you come to Africa and you preach to us about elections and democracy and whatever. Why are your companies taking money from our, you know, electoral leaders in order to make these things happen? What is the profit motive? What is the incentive? What do you get out of, for example, McKinsey helping Isabel Dos Santos in Angola, you know, ex expropriate millions, billions of, of dollars of Angola's taxpayers' money? What is the international interest that is behind that? And I, you know, I raise this question and there's always a lot of discomfort because it goes to what you're saying. It goes to about how international capital allying itself with power, allying itself with people who are, um, you know, not doing, not interested in politics for the greater good or for changing society or for whatever, but interested in for making money. And, and then you, you want to sit and you say, well, now that you have all the money, but, you know, everyone's dead and all the rivers are poisoned and you can't eat anything and everything's ruined. What's the, is the money going to keep you warm at night? You know, this is actually, you know, not even hypothetically, this is the moment that we're moving towards. We have, um, in our last election, one of our politicians came up with the phrase "vifaranga via computer," which roughly translates as um, uh, the chickens that hatched from the computers, the chicks that hatched from the computers. Because there was, I mean, the election was just there were so many issues with the election, and and the outcome of the election has always been questionable. And now we're stuck with a leadership that clearly doesn't know what they're doing, that clearly doesn't have the best interest of the civilians at, at heart, and is but is still welcomed as you know a prog as not a progressive but as a as a as an example for other african countries that you know forget the fact that you know all of these systems have clearly been compromised blah 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 let's just accept them there's something in there about the way in which this alliance is willing to look the other way as people are being devoured, as ordinary people are being devoured. Um, the problem with the public health systems in Europe, it's not just that there's no PPE, it's that the money for that PPE was taken off the budget and is allocated to something else. You know, it's not just that we're having to depend on immigrant workers because um, there's, you know, they're there, but it's also because they can, they're an exploitable class. They're people who can be underpaid for tremendously dangerous work, for tremendously risky, um, you know, for, and, and can be underpaid and can be minimum wage or below minimum wage. So, you know, I think that we're, again, I keep coming back to this, we're seeing the outcomes. We're seeing the outcomes of what happens when democracy becomes a financial, you know, um, what they call those machines, like a, like a slot machine. We're seeing what happens when uh, crisis capitalism and democracy and, and all of these things get um, muddled up together. Are we going to be radical enough to do things differently? So this is, to me, one of the pillars, radical imagination. Radical imagination. <laughs> Vanessa is here, finally, for the... Uh, Vanessa, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead, go ahead before we lose you. Uh, I'm so sorry for the connection. Can you hear me clearly? Yeah, great. Loudly, clearly, brilliant. Yeah. Super. <laughs> it's finally showing green. So, yeah, thank you so much for, for the invitation. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Vanessa Nakate, and I am a climate activist 
from Uganda. Becoming a climate activist was a process for me. I remember in the year 2018, I wanted to do something that could cause change in the lives of the people in my community and in my country. Therefore, I started carrying out research to understand the challenges that the people back here at home faced. And I was really surprised to find that climate change was one of those challenges. So I decided to read more about it, to understand its causes and uh, its impacts on the people in my community. I realized that some of the people were facing some of these impacts. For example, uh, an even distribution of rainfall, bringing about short rainy seasons and longer dry spells, hence threatening availability of food and water for many people. Because in the case of uh, occurrence of a flood or a drought, many people end up losing not only their homes, but also their farms. And yet I come from a country where almost everyone heavily depends on subsistence farming so and we all know the impact that climate change has on agriculture and people's crops so it really uh, puts a very big threat on the food sector and the availability of food for people and also water for people so when i realized all these things i decided that I would start uh, doing activism. I really didn't know much about it. So I decided to read about past movements and I got to find out about the Fridays for Future movement. Then I decided that I would do that very thing in my country and I started striking for climate in the first week of January. 2019 and uh, later on I started striking for the Congo rainforest uh, basically because this is the largest rainforest in Africa and it faces a threat of uh, of destruction so I wanted to create awareness so that we put all the challenges that it faces and that we are able to to protect it so as an activist, I have been doing activism for over a year now. And of course, with activism comes uh, certain kinds of struggles, certain kinds of challenges, because at the very beginning, you realize that you don't have any support. You don't have anyone helping you out. I remember my own family pitching in on my activism came in after like nine months of striking for, for the climate and uh it wasn't so easy for me because most of the times I was striking by myself. Sometimes I would be joined by a friend or two. So it was kind of hard, especially uh, on the streets or in front of a parliament whereby um, they ask so many questions because I come from a developing, a developing country and we all know how developing countries tend to take any kind of strikes as uh, political strikes. So they ask so many questions, they do so many checks, and that has been a challenge for me as an activist. And also doing activism alone for that long time with no one's support, not even family support was also a problem. My siblings helped me out for the first climate strike, but after that they had to uh, go, back, uh, go back to school because they were in boarding and no one, no one was there to do the strikes with me. But I still just kept on moving because I really wanted to bring change to the people who are facing the direct impacts of climate change. I think the other struggle that I've faced as an activist has been a struggle of uh, getting my voice out and telling the stories of the people in my community because it is so hard to talk about the problems that the people in uh, the most affected regions are facing. The, the problems that they are facing because many times first of all these people never have uh they never have voices or they have few voices that speak for them but even those few voices that speak for them you find that they don't have enough uh, coverage or they don't have enough audience or they really don't get out they really can't speak out louder so i always had a problem of trying to do this and that and doing so much in my activism so that I could highlight the problems of the people in my community. But it, it is so hard compared to the kind
kind of world that that we are living in in my community people don't really care about climate change only a few care about it and that's um, mainly those who have maybe studied about it in school and maybe did courses in regards to environmental studies but then the rest of the population people don't know about it people don't even understand it they don't know the connection between climate change fossil fuel they really don't understand all that stuff so it is very hard if you if a person doesn't have resources to help educate those people and also to do uh to do the strikes and create awareness to the world because you realize that the people from my country or from the african continent at large they are not responsible for the global emissions they are the least emitters of carbons but then they are being the most affected so you realize that if i'm demanding for action as an activist my main demand is going to the people who have the power who have the resources who hold the industries that are responsible for the climate crisis but as an activist it has been hard to get to speak to those people to let them know how people are suffering to let them realize that climate change is not coming in the future that climate change is already here right now that those have been some of the challenges that i've faced as an activist maybe also um the challenge whereby I was cropped out of a photo, I think that was really a trying time for me. And uh, yeah, it was really a great, great uh, challenge at that time. It made me very, very emotional because I, already I was feeling the pressure of doing so much just to show what is going on in my community. And then the the media and the cropping, it just made the whole situation even feel worse. It made me realize that me as uh, an African child, I really don't have much privilege when it comes to the international uh, stage or even to the world stage. And my it made me feel like my voice doesn't really count. But I must say that uh, there, there was a lot of support from that. And um, I came out yeah. stronger in the end. Yeah. Yeah. And this is, uh, I mean, here you are like, this is why we build the Progressive International for people like you to learn from people at, at, uh, like you and also to learn together and to offer this platform and to make our voices louder, you know, like uh, we are here to support movements like you and you are here to inspire people like you as well. And also to learn, uh, if you look at the, uh, the people already involved, we have very senior uh, um, female activists who have gone through lots of struggles in their lifetime we we hope to to connect all these pieces uh, especially from countries from the global south but from like to connect as many people as possible and that's uh, the space that we want to offer uh, and media is uh, something that you mentioned that is very important we are like a partner with media who will always give you a space and who will always give to our struggles uh, the the relevance they deserve so we are starting to wrap up and and we wrap up by uh, the, uh, describing the third pillar and the third pillar is movement precisely uh, we are like overwhelmed by the response after launching on on monday uh, thousands have joined and not only uh, individuals uh, from all ages and from all uh, places all over the world who are already working as volunteers translating and bringing ideas in but also and the and movements so we can build this as a movement of movements and and uh, so i let uh, janice nanjala and, and vanessa to say last words and then we grab up and we see each other hopefully soon hopefully here hope maybe in different language maybe with different people you you want to say a few words Renata? last thing yeah. words <laughs> I feel privileged to be in the midst, uh, to be the only representative of the defective gen gender, and I mean that without a sense of irony, uh, and to be also the older person around. Uh, what we all this can do um, in a movement like this is uh, help provide the institutional memory from movements of the past centuries not just decades, yeah. uh, to answer the question that uh, many people, by the way, on our YouTube channel, I notice, are asking, so what do we do? Because, you know, Vanessa is, doing, is carrying out her activism uh, brilliantly and in an inspirational way, 
uh, we are all doing our little things wherever we happen to, to be, but now we are getting together and we have to do something together. And my suggestion is that in order to allow the collective anger and frustration that most people around the world feel to yield hope, rational hope, and um, yeah. a program that we can act upon, we need to do two things. Firstly, we need to answer the question, how do we spend between eight and $10 trillion every year on the green transition, which is necessary to save the planet and to create the good quality jobs that will provide incomes and dignity to people. That's the first thing we need to do, an international green new deal for the world. And nobody has it. We need to produce it. We can do it. We have the expertise. The difficult part is the second part. How do we enact it? And I, my, my personal view, and I'll just close with this, is that we need collectively to act in support of each Vanessa in the world. Imagine if Vanessa's struggle was supported by the network of people from Greece, from Germany, from Iceland, from the United States. Imagine if we had a day of action against Amazon, where all over the world, for one day, nobody buys from Amazon until the conditions of their workers is improved. One such action every day in pursuit of an international Green New Deal that is feminist, that is ecological, and which is um, restoring power to the powerless. Yeah. Thank you, Yanis. Uh, Nanjala, please. Um, yeah, I am a student of history, and I my favorite thing in the world is ideas. I love ideas. And I think part of the reason why I love ideas so much is that I came up in an education system, kind of like what Vanessa was describing, that, you know, we are, we're not taught to think critically about why the world looks the way that it does. We're taught that our role in the world, our education system tells us that you are labor. Your job is to find a suitable place within the value chain as your labor, give your labor for the next 40, 50 years, and then retire, and then, you know, go and use your labor for something else and maybe start to find yourself. And I, I feel this very keenly because the post-independence generation in Kenya is starting to retire. And all over Nairobi, there's like a, a plethora of people who are, you know, in their 60s and 70s who don't know what to do with themselves because for the last 40, 50 years, they've been labor. They've not been given any opportunities to explore what fully what that humanity um, is. And so what I want to do is to make space in our movements for ideas, for thinking together and for imagining together. Nothing that we are living under is inevitable. Everything that we're living under, everything that we're struggling against, everything that we're pushing back against is a consequence of ideas, is a consequence of action, is a consequence of behavior. And all of those things are within our power to control. And so as I, when I unite those two things together, I, my, um, I don't know, call to action would be imagine radical futures and start to work towards them. Imagine just futures, imagine equitable futures, imagine inclusive futures, imagine sustainable futures, imagine joyful futures and start to work towards them. That I think is the most important thing that we can do um, for ourselves and for the coming generations. We've inherited a world that was deprived of all of these things, equality, sustainability, and even just joy. You know, we're being told that the arts are superfluous, that music is superfluous, that good books are luxury, that, you know, like joy is a luxury. And we have to start the process of imagining these radical futures and then working towards building them together. Well, it was a delightful, reflective, fun, amazing, hopeful hour with all of you. And uh, we lost Vanessa again, but ah, she's back. She's back for her, uh, her final reflection. And then we close and say goodbye. Yeah. Vanessa, go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, what I would like to say is that uh, we as activists or people who are working towards uh, a healthier planet for everyone, we need to keep on moving and uh, with more momentum even after the COVID-19 pandemic, because we realize that many governments are going to go into recess with their economies and they're going to try as much as possible to build back their economies at whatever cost. And we understand that the people's lives and also the planet, yeah. they are most likely to be at stake and uh, 
they're most likely going to be affected because of what governments are going to do because we of course we expect some of them to bail out oil and gas companies and this is something that we as activists are cannot accept so we need to even push with more momentum during this uh, lockdown period of the pandemic and even after the pandemic so that we make our our requests and our demands clear to the leaders that Yes, we may be in this crisis, but we have a much bigger crisis that has been here for a long time, that is still here and that has been claiming uh, people's lives. And then also uh, we need to try and be uh, more inclusive in helping out different activists from different parts of the world especially those who are from the most affected communities, because at the end of the day, we can't have uh, climate justice without environmental justice. And the only way that we will achieve environmental justice is by helping out the most affected communities and bringing solutions and resilience into the people's lives so that we can make their environment and their livelihoods much better. And then also, um, we, li we literally just need to stick to what we've been doing and even keep doing it better so that we can build a more sustainable uh, path to development, a more sustainable livelihood for people and more sustainable cities and countries because this pandemic has exposed so much of the people's vulnerability and uh, the systems of the world and how vulnerable they are I remember my, 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 my parents were asking me about a specific uh, country and saying that we thought they were so powerful, but the, 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 the pandemic has exposed how the health systems are so weak and how um, people don't even have enough uh, spaces. They even have people who sleep on the streets and they don't even have where to sleep in this pandemic. So what I can say is that the pandemic has exposed a lot of vulnerability for many countries, for many people. So even after this pandemic, we need to push for an environment that is more inclusive for everyone so that people can have access to basic needs like food, like health facilities and uh, shelter. You know, uh, there are some countries whereby the leaders, if they fall sick, they take them to another country. But now they've reached a point whereby <laughs> the airports are closed, so they can't even they can't even fly out for treatment. So this should be a message to the leaders to uh, just style up and uh, build the systems within their countries for the benefit of everyone. Yeah. Thank you so much, you Vanessa. So much, Vanessa. And, and, and to everybody watching, I, I have to say, uh, please join us. Please donate. We are still building this movement. It's all run by volunteers, but we still have to keep the pipes running. Keep. Uh, we want to do a lot of things this year. Help us. Uh, I mean, uh, we want to depend on donations like your donation, very small donations and collaborations and actions that we can do together. Uh, you can go to progressive.international uh, slash uh, join and join us. Uh, thank you for sharing this night with us and thank you for you all the wonderful things that we, we are going to build together. And thank you, Nanjala, and thank you, Janice, and th thank you, Vanessa, and thank you to all the team behind this uh, who made it yes. possible. Have a beautiful weekend.